having a conversation this afternoon with Professor Jerome Carson. I can't even speak. Let's start that one again, shall we? <laughs> okay. So good afternoon. We are having a conversation with Professor Jerome Carson from the Psychology Department at the University of Bolton. How are you today? Great. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, just getting used to the changes that are about to uh, come upon us as lockdown eases. I know. Changes again. I think we've only just got used to the first lot of changes and now it's all easing and we're all perhaps coming back on campus. Yeah, I think that would be a, a slow process, but it will. I think it will start after Easter. You think? Much well, more so. Whilst we started with the topic of COVID, how about we stick with it? So how has COVID been for you? Well, I, th I think uh, the first uh, the first lockdown was very hard because I actually uh, am clinically vulnerable. So it meant that I wasn't allowed to go out of the house and I, I stuck to that religiously. So I didn't go out for, uh, crikey, it was about nine weeks. Wow. I mean, it really was a difficult time. Uh, but early on, uh, my sister had sent me a, a message, which was, uh, don't count the days, make the days count. And uh, I thought, well, hold on. Now she'd been diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer. Oh, wow. So she's suddenly looking at the world in a different way. And uh, I mean, of course, as, as we all know, how you look at the world determines how you feel. So I, I started actually, instead of feeling sorry for myself, actually thinking, right, OK, let's get on and do something. So what did you do? Well, I think one of the things I did was I, I, I formed little research bubbles. So, uh, I mean, I, I supervise student projects at uh, undergraduate level, master's level and a PhD. So, uh, you know, a number of the students I was working with had done some very good work. So uh, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is to get some of that work published. Now, of course, one of the difficulties with uh, publication is it isn't all a smooth process. And there's an awful lot of rejection uh, to deal with along the way. One particular student just approached me out of the blue, he had finished his undergraduate and was waiting to do his master's. And he actually said, can we try and write something together? Now, we tried to get his, his final year project published. That was rejected three times. Uh, is now in, in submission for a fourth time. But along the way, we started on a couple of other pieces of work. And we've actually had two major peer-reviewed papers published. Wow. We've just written an editorial together. And I'm sure we're going to be collaborating on other work as well. Uh, so that was someone who approached me. Uh, it's an interesting thing, publication, because I think publication really, uh, to my mind, depends on uh, how ambitious the student is. Okay. So if a PhD student wants to get published and they really push that, then they, they will get published. But, you know, if you're just going to wait for it to come, it's not going to happen. Uh, and, you know, I've had PhD students who've published uh, quite a bit. They've got to be driven. And uh, when they're driven, that drives me. And uh, together we can achieve things. So I think it, it has offered an opportunity for people to do more writing. I've, I've, I've published more in the last year than in my entire career. Really? Wow. I think that's um, those words can go across all kinds of life events you know if you push to do if you really want to do anything you will achieve it won't you if you don't nothing's going to just come and knock on your door whether it's publications or just getting a job or coping I guess with any situation it's a really good word so how you said that lockdown one was particularly hard for you what coping mechanisms did you use uh, I, th I think my main coping mechanism was eating. I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> uh, I think that was the I think that was the main way. I, I gave up drinking about uh, four and a half years ago, so that wasn't an option. Though I think for a number of people, probably uh, alcohol consumption was was very high. Not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, mainly eating, uh, and because I couldn't go out and walk because uh, you weren't allowed out at first. Uh, people said, oh, you could have just sneaked out 
in the morning when there weren't many people around. But I, I did, I, I stuck to the letter of the law religiously. I think this lockdown has been a bit easier. I've, I've gone out to the supermarket at night when it's much quieter and got some groceries. At that stage, I was relying on a colleague and uh, her husband to drop food off for me on a weekly basis. And, and uh, you know, that without their support, it would have been uh, so much harder. I mean, it was so, it was so uh, uh, difficult that uh, towards the end, I, I'd forgotten my PIN number. Oh. Because if you're not using your PIN number, you see. Yeah, of course. Uh, when do you use your PIN number? When when you actually buy some in the supermarket, you, you, you make a cash point withdrawal. And I completely forgot it. Uh, so that was a that was a bit of a difficulty, but uh, hasn't happened this time around. That's good. How have you found doing lectures online during COVID? How has that been? And, and not just lectures, but supporting students. Uh, I, I think, I mean, that's actually probably been more convenient for students to actually have Zoom uh, sessions with their PhD supervisor, because you've not got to travel all the way to university for a one hour meeting, travel all the way back. You know, so that, that's, made, that's been really, really convenient. I don't think that has suffered. Uh, I, I think lectures are a different thing. It's very hard to be as enthusiastic sitting in at a chair in your office as it, as it is in front of a room of people. And there have been a number of complaints from academics about the numbers of students that don't have the camera on. So you might be speaking to a screen where there's actually only one person who's actually <laughs> there with you, as it were, looking at you. So I think you missed those cues. Uh, you also, funny enough, the the few sessions that I was in for on campus, when people have the masks on, you can't really get the proper uh, uh, facial cues with masks on. So that, I think that's what we will go back to initially, to classrooms with masks. Uh, and that, that's going to be a bit tricky, but it's, I think it's much harder for PhD students because for a PhD student anyway, you're on your own. Uh, it is the, I mean, PhD students are the elite of the university. They are the most talented students in that university. They're the people that are working towards uh, the top academic qualification. There's nothing higher than a PhD. A PhD is the pinnacle. So, uh, you know, in that, in that sense, I think we need to really value and respect our PhD students because, you know, that they're, they're doing the most difficult thing. They're doing it with the least support. I mean, you obviously have a training program, uh, but you know uh, there there aren't sort of regular lectures modules the way there are at undergraduate level. Uh, there's there's comparatively little teaching, so for a lot of the time you're on your own, and you have to work through it with your director of studies. So it's very tough. Uh, there's, there's no question it's a it's a very tough journey, but ultimately very rewarding. Yes. Whilst we're talking about journeys, I think it's important to talk about your journey. Mm -hmm. So, how did you, well, how did you find education coming out of high school? How was that? How was education? For you, high school, were you an academic student? Were you a student? Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, I, I was probably one of the swats at school. Uh, you know, so, uh, and I, I had, I mean, my mother actually always, uh, sort of inculcated in me the notion that I was going to go to university. So there was no question that I was going to go to university. Uh, you know, I had 10 uh, GCSEs, O levels in, in those days and three A levels, a grade B, which in those days were probably a little different than today, perhaps. Uh, I went to Reading University, got an upper second class honours. It was when I was at uh, Reading uh, studying psychology, and I hadn't done psychology A-level before. In fact, I had no plans to do psychology. I was originally wanting to do geography, which was my best subject at school. We didn't have psychology in those days at the school I was at. And I went to a geography teacher and I said, listen, you know, where should I go and study geography? And she said, why don't you just go and study something different? I said, what? 
why don't you do psychology or sociology? I was a bit shocked at that because I only wanted to know the best place for geography. Anyway, uh, for whatever reason, I listened to her. And uh, in the summer, I decided, uh, well, before I went on the summer holidays, I decided I was going to do psychology and sociology. And then over the summer holidays, as I read quite a bit, I thought, well, psychology seems a bit more interesting. Sociology seems a bit more flaky, if I can put it like that. Uh, so when I got to Reading, in fact, I discovered for your first two terms, uh, semesters now in, in the language today, uh, you actually did three subjects. So I thought, oh, wow, OK. So I didn't do the sociology. I picked psychology, uh, economics and politics. Now, I'd studied economics at A-level. I thought that would be easy. But in fact, it was the only one that when we had the exams, I couldn't go on and do to degree level. Uh, I could only do either psychology or politics. So uh, I was a bit ambivalent about psychology because it wasn't quite what I thought it would be. Uh, I mean, in those days, you studied rats and, and uh, there was all this complicated stuff about memory and learning. And I, I thought it was going to be all about understanding people. So I was totally naive. Uh, but uh, funny enough, there was a chap in the karate club. So I was in the karate club at university. And he said, why don't you stick with it? It will get better. So I did. And I think in the second year, I began to think, well, I'd like to do clinical, which is, uh, you know, a branch of applied psychology, very hard to get into. And after I got my degree, I spent a year as nursing assistant, then a year as a research assistant before I got on to my clinical training. And I did my clinical training at the University of East London, okay. which then was a master's degree. In the 1990s, uh, it became a doctorate in clinical psychology, but in those days it was an MSc. So I did my clinical training and then I worked in the health service uh, as a clinical psychologist. And I suppose I developed an interest in research then and, uh, you know, began to think, oh, if we're doing this little survey, why, why don't we try and get it published? And it, it started off gradually. It was only really when I moved in 1992 to the Institute of Psychiatry in South London that my interest in research really took off okay. because that was the mecca of psychiatry. What research opportunities did you have doing your undergraduate degree or moving on to the... So you said it was an MSc, was it? In clinical psychology? I did an MSc in clinical. Uh, well, really, that I mean, the, you, you did a project which would really be akin to an undergraduate project. Okay. It wasn't very high powered. Uh, because the main thing is obviously you were training to be a clinical psychologist. So you had to do, I think in those days, I had five, six month placements in different clinical settings. And you, I mean, you had exams, first and second year exams. and. In those days, you had to write up 10 case studies. So 10 people who you actually were made better by your administrations rather than people who got worse. Uh, well, at least that's what people tried to do. They tried to find the successes rather than the probably more common failures. Uh, but uh, I suppose it, it's, it's an even uh, bigger area for imposter syndrome. Yeah. because how do you really know how you're helping particular individuals that you're actually counselling? Yeah, exactly. What made you interested in clinical psychology? What was it? Well, it, it, and it may be this is what the teacher actually recognised, because when I was 16, my mother died, and that was and still is the major uh, trauma of my own life because uh, that, I mean, that turns your world upside down. I was the eldest of five children. And I think, you know, obviously there was, there was something in me about needing to be cared for. And one of the ways of dealing with a need to be cared for is to, is to care for others. And uh, there's no accident that uh, I think uh, two of my sisters became nurse, nurses. My brother was a nurse. And my other sister became a teacher. Now, if you contrast that with our closest uh, cousins, they're all engineers. So we all ended up in the caring profession. They all ended up as engineers, you know. So, I mean, I, I, I think I, you know, given my sort of background, 
I don't think I, I was very lucky actually. I couldn't have found a better subject in psychology. Would looking back, would you um are you pleased you moved from geography onto psychology? Do you have any regrets? Uh, not in the slightest. No. No, I mean the, the thing with psychology as a subject is it covers such a broad range of areas that there's something in psychology for everyone. You know, it's a subject that has got so much breadth that, I mean, you, you know, if you're just interested in evolutionary psychology, for example, you could just do that. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, our university, we've three pathways, uh, psychology, uh, psychotherapy and counselling, uh, criminal forensic psychology and, and straight psychology. Uh, we're hoping to have a new one on uh, neuroscience, neuropsychology, wow. uh, starting in, in September. But, you know, you've got such breadth in the subject. Uh, I can't understand what the fascination is with forensic, to be honest, <laughs> as I'm much more interested in the clinical field. And, I mean, you know, the clinical field, as we know, I mean, mental health problems, uh, when I started out, weren't as... Uh, as well recognized as they are now. I mean, you know, it's a, uh, you know, the figures suggest that in, in a lifetime, perhaps one in two people will develop a, a mental health problem. So if we look at the two of us, it's, it's one of us, Lindsay. <laughs> or both of us. <laughs> or both of us, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, then. So carrying on with your journey, then, how, so you said, it was inevitable. Do you have you gone on to do a PhD? Has that been yes, a, yes. How well, when I when I went to the Institute of Psychiatry, I, I mentioned that's the mecca of psychiatry. So you know, suddenly you're working with people who are on the television. Wow. Uh, you know, they're that famous. You're working with people who who've done books and papers, and uh, I, I was a bit awestruck. Uh, so the, the head of department who 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 was still around though he'd retired was a chap called. Uh, Hans Jürgen Eisenk, who was probably the most famous British psychologist I ever. I that name. Just, just yeah, uh, well, Eisenk personality questionnaire is uh, he's immortalised in that. Yeah. He's actually German, but he came to this country in his twenties and, and never went back to Germany. So he was floating around the department, and when I was an undergraduate, we heard about him, and you think, and here I am working in a department where he was the head. The head then. When I was there, there was a chap called Professor Jeffrey Gray, who was very famous for the neuropsychology of anxiety. Now he was, uh, he had he had been a senior lecturer in Oxford. He was a brilliant man, uh, you know. And you worked with him, and thought, wow. Uh, but the, that department was, I mean, a lot. Most of them are now eminent professors. They were really, they were all clinical psychologists but they were all focused on research and clinical psychology. So the post there was actually uh, a clinic, what's called a clinical academic post. So it's actually a clinical post where you're meant to do quite a bit of clinical research. Okay. And all of them did, you know, they really were. I mean, you, you, I mean, talk about role models. I mean, virtually everyone there had published more than I had. So, you know, there was only one way to go, which was was up. But you never really uh, or ever would catch some of these characters. They were so prolific in research terms. What was your research area? Uh, originally, my research area was an area called psychiatric rehabilitation. And part of the reason I went to work at the Institute of Psychiatry was to work with uh, a psychiatrist called Frank Holloway. He was one of two mentors I've had during my career, the other being uh, Professor Kevin Gurney. And um, I'm actually still in regular touch with both men. Uh, so they've been with me uh, since uh, 1992. Uh, so I've known them a, a long time, really. And uh, they've guided me, they've inspired me. I've published quite a bit of work with them also. Wow. How has your research changed? So I, I, I started with psychiatric rehabilitation and then uh, worked with, uh, Frank was doing research in case management, was a particular approach uh, to working with people in the community. 
and we did work on that on quality of life and a few things and then Frank actually uh, left and he went to work in Croydon and he asked me to go with him but I was by then I'm afraid getting much more interested in the clinical work so I really had, had moved from being uh, a sort of a clinician researcher to being a full-time clinician so for a number of years my research activity went right off the boil now paradoxically it was in 2006 when the institute was preparing for the 2008 research assessment exercise now the institute was a five-star rated institution so you know it only it had elite people and uh, I got my PhD in 2005 and when I had been promoted to senior lecturer in 1997 they said the only way you're going to go any higher here is if you get a PhD you will never be more than a senior lecturer unless you get a PhD well 2005 I got my PhD but uh, I'd take my eye off the ball and what hadn't been publishing much so I was asked to uh, switch over to a trust contract. Uh, there's a sort of symbiotic relationship between the Institute of Psychiatry and uh, the Maudsley. Uh, so one was the research side, the other was the clinical side. And of course, the research was all with, with patients with mental health problems. So from 2006 to 2011, when I took early retirement from the NHS, I, I devoted myself uh, for five years to looking at recovery from uh, mental health problems. Uh, and that is still a huge interest of mine today. But uh, when I moved to Bolton in 2012, I developed a, an interest in positive psychology. And so recovery from mental health problems and positive psychology are probably the two biggest areas of my research. Okay, just moving back a little bit, I feel yeah. like we've skipped forward. So you said that you were a senior lecturer. I'm sorry, did I miss that? Where were you a senior lecturer? I, I did, yeah. At, at the Institute of Psychiatry. Uh, and Institute. I was a senior lecturer in psychiatric rehabilitation, which was the area, the clinical area. But yeah. as I say, I, I lost my way a bit. And uh, mainly when Frank left. And, you know, you can go back and say, hmm, I mean, you asked me, was it a mistake choosing psychology over geography? No, it wasn't. That was a very wise move. Should I have gone with Frank when he moved? Probably, but I didn't. Uh, and then, you know, when I was asked to switch to a trust contract, which was actually moving from being a senior lecturer to being, if I wanted, an honorary senior lecturer. Now, look, you know, when you've been a senior lecturer, mm -hmm. being an honorary senior lecturer, nothing you because you've already been a full senior lecturer so I, I refused the title and just switched to being a consultant clinical psychologist uh, but that got me into mental health recovery and uh, as well as my own uh, ego recovery I suppose self-esteem recovery and uh, that was a really productive time when I co-edited three books and established a whole series of papers around recovery heroes, remarkable lives, and historical recovery heroes. So talk to me about your PhD then. How did you end up on the PhD path? And what was your thesis? Well, uh, it was, it, I mean, one of the things I, I've, I've, there's a thing on YouTube where I've talked about uh, doing a PhD and, and setbacks in academic life. And the first time I, I did a PhD, uh, I spent about three and a half years on it. I wasn't getting anywhere and uh, I was doing it via the Open University and uh, I was given an ultimatum, you either uh, take a year out or you finish. So I actually, in the end, decided, well, I'd, I'd drop out. So when I went to the Institute and they were saying, right, you know, the only way you're going to go higher is if you get a, a PhD. So that was a, a great incentive to work on a PhD. And my PhD was about assessments and interventions in dealing with staff stress. Uh, so that's, and, and it, it, what, it, what I did was I built on a lot of research I'd been doing uh, for a number of years before that. So that had become another research area apart from uh, psychiatric rehabilitation. 
uh, and uh, I co-edited two books. First book was 1995, uh, Stress and Coping in Mental Health Nursing, edited with uh, Lenny Fig and, and Sue Ritter. And then another book uh, a couple of years later uh, on occupational stress. Uh, so, and I published, I think about 17 peer reviewed papers and a number of professional papers. So it was a, going into an area that I was already very comfortable with. And I made that my PhD, but it wasn't a, a straightforward journey. And uh, I've- No, sorry, I was saying, no, it doesn't sound like a straightforward journey. <clears throat> Thinking about, you said um, you were given the ultimatum. Yeah. How, what advice would you give to students now completing their PhD? What would you have done differently? Was there anything, I'm trying to think, was there anything in the run up to that that caused that chain reaction at the time? Because obviously you were working in the area, you were publishing papers, you were co-editing books so what was it at that time where you just weren't able to complete your PhD? Well no I, I, well, I that was the, the sort of first time around the second time around I completed it because yeah, I'd actually picked an area that I was interested in so I think what advice for a PhD student make sure you pick an area that's going to sustain you because yes. you're going to be working on that for at least three years now, the only exception to that I've ever come across was my old colleague, Professor Gisley G. Johnson, who finished his PhD in 18 months. But he's a one off. Most people take at least three years. So you've really got to pick an area that you will like because, you know, you're not going to be researching anything else for three years. So it's got to be something that really is going to sustain you as an individual. Something that you're invested in, something that you yeah. believe, and for you, that's the difference. Yeah, I, I think that's the difference for everyone. I mean, I think, you know, that, that's why it's. I mean, I have a student at the moment who's a brilliant master's student, and she doesn't know what area to do a PhD in. Now she's easily capable of doing a PhD. She's one of the brightest students I've worked with, but she's not sure what area. And I think that's a real difficulty because. You've got to feel passionate about the area. I mean, I know you, you've chosen an area that you feel very passionate about. And I think I think that's the key. Because yeah. then, you know, that, that passion drives you along. Yeah. Uh, so you're able, better able to cope with the ups and downs of the PhD journey. I mean, no PhD journey is, is, uh, is uneventful. There are setbacks, there are successes, setbacks, successes, you know. It goes to and fro. So you've actually, I think the most important thing is finding an area that, that you really believe in and you want to do something that's going to make a difference. Okay. Is there, on the flip side of that, a, a possibility of becoming too involved? Could that be a negative, being too invested in your PhD area? Uh, to be honest, I don't think so. I know some people might say that and some people might say, well, you know, you're only working in that area because it's an area of problem in, in your own life, for example. I think the critical thing is uh, having the interest in the area. That's the main thing, you know, because if, if you're really interested, that's what keeps you going. You want to make a, a difference to that field. And, you know, in all PhDs, you have to have, uh, and it's very difficult sometimes to, to prove this, but you have to make uh, what's called a unique contribution to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're really working in an area you believe in, you're more likely to do that than just, I mean, you know, what is, I mean, one of the problems we have at Bolton is unlike uh, the, the Russell Group universities where there are a lot of funded PhDs, the problem with the funded PhD is you arrive on day one, here you are, Lindsay, uh, this is the, your PhD, which is going to be looking at eating disorders. I'm not really completely interested in that. Mm, are you getting paid to do it, actually, Lindsay? So just get on with it. Yeah. So, you know, I think there are people, the problem with funded PhDs is sometimes you don't have a choice over the area that you're investigating. You have to, to follow what the funding is given for. 
so paradoxically, funding yourself, where you pick your area, uh, is, is probably better in motivational terms. Yeah, okay. How important is your supervisor? Well, you know, it, it's a, it is a, a very interesting question uh, because the, the problem with a PhD is you get allocated a director of studies and, uh, you know, you, you generally, in most cases, you're with that person for the whole three years. So the, the, that, that's the role of that supervisor and how important that supervisor is absolutely critical because, you know, you're going to spend three years with them, minimum. You know, so, and, and you don't know who these people are, you know, so I think that's quite, quite tricky, uh, particularly if you come from outside and you've, uh, you know, it's one thing, isn't it, reading about someone and looking at some of their publications, maybe looking at some of their stuff on YouTube and think, oh, they're, they're an interesting person. But it's only when you actually meet them and get to relate to them. And obviously, as at the PhD level, you're, you're working in a, a much more detailed sense with the person. Previously, if someone's only giving you lectures, I mean, you're only seeing one side of it. All right, OK, you do project with someone. You get to see them a bit more. But I mean, a project, what's a project last six months? Uh, a PhD is, as we keep saying, is a minimum of three years. So, you know, it's a long time. And I think, I think that can be tricky uh, because, you know, if you get the wrong person, uh, oh, crikey, what do I do? Uh, well, contact Andy Graham and, and chat to Andy. Uh, occasionally it happens that you, uh, you know, you swap. Uh, students at PhD level uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think I think we need to be uh, much more open about that type of thing. Uh, it's not a disaster. It happens. Uh, and, you know, you get over it, get on with it. Uh, but what you can't do is keep changing. So, you know, I, I don't think it'd be good if you said, oh, can I have a change? And then three months after you've changed, so I think I may have made a mistake, um, actually. Have you got any more? <laughs> uh, any more that I could have a go with. Go on, go on. <laughs> the, well, the problem in, in a small university is that there's only a, there's a limited number of personnel. So, uh, you know, who else could you have, really? Uh, but so, yeah, this is a, absolutely, the relationship with your director of studies is absolutely critical. I mean, obviously, you've got a second supervisor. Their involvement varies depending on the student. Sometimes there may be co-supervision, so two heads rather than one, that can be good. Uh, but again, they may have conflicting ideas on the best way forward, which leaves you confused. Uh, but I know, I, I, I think uh, one of the advantages of uh, a place like Bolton for doing a PhD is uh, because the, the focus in Bolton is teaching intensive research from forms, uh, people are not selected uh, because they just have a research portfolio. And, you know, you're going to come across some of the best researchers may not be the best supervisors because they're basically just interested in doing their own research. And again, when, when I worked at the Institute, you know, if you got one of the famous professors uh, as, a, a, as a clinical trainee, you might never see them because they're often traveling all around Europe, you know. Yeah, of course. So, swings and roundabouts, right? What advice would you give yourself looking back? About? Ooh, about so many different areas, I think. You've had such a journey. I think in particular about your time at the Institute of Psychiatry. You right, mentioned okay. one of your regrets may well be you didn't go with Frank. Yeah, and, and another regret would be that I... I allowed myself to take my eye off the ball and I didn't, uh, you know, fight hard enough to stay there, actually, uh, to, which was basically about getting uh, more prestigious publications. Uh, I mean, that's a regret. I wrote a, I wrote a book chapter afterwards entitled The Best of Times, The, the Worst of Times, uh, which is sort of nicked from uh, a novelist called Charles Dickens. And uh, Come on, no, no. <laughs> so the, I, I think, you know, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, because when you actually, you know, you're asked to 
have a free transfer to the trust. It's it's it's, it's pretty uh, humiliating in, in, in some respects. Uh, but the time there, I mean, is fantastic because to have worked with some of the greatest people. I mean, last week, or the week before last, now Professor Julian Left died. Now Julian Left, uh, I, I was in a film that, that he was involved with, and he he ran a supervision group, that, and I was one of the the sort of members of staff in that supervision group. So I got to work with them quite closely. Uh, and you know, when you're working with people at that level, uh, you know, you, you you never forget that. I mean, you know. Isaac, I spoke to a couple of times. Jeffrey Gray, as I said, was my line manager. The guy that came in to take over was uh, Professor David Clark when Jeffrey Gray retired. Uh, Mark Seligman describes uh, David Clark as uh, the greatest clinical psychologist in Britain. Mark was wrong. Uh, I think the greatest clinical psychologist in Great Britain is Professor Peter Fonagy from mm -hmm. University College London who is a, a remarkable guy. Uh, but, you know, to, to, when you've worked with these people that are absolutely at the top of their game, and you're a colleague, you know, they treat you as an equal. Wow. Uh, I mean, I was never an equal. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a session for, on, on post-grad uh, training program coming up on uh, uh, publications, uh, getting published. And uh, one of the things, one of the slides that I've been preparing is uh, being a, a big fish in a small pond versus being a small fish in a big pond. And uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry, I was a, a little fish in a big pond. And part of your job there was not to get eaten by some of the bigger fish there. Uh, whereas Bolton is a much smaller place, it's much easier to have an impact. In, in Bolton, I think already I'm the third most prolific researcher in, in the history of Bolton. Uh, now, you know, I'm obviously not satisfied with that. I want to walk out of this university as the most prolific researcher ever. But, you know, when you compare me with many of the characters that were my contemporaries at the Institute of Psychiatry, I'm not even in the same league. Really? Uh, so, you know, you, you have to step back and think, hmm, how good am I really? Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm aware of uh, my deficiencies. I'm aware of my strengths. Uh, but I know that, uh, I mean, I'm now, I'm coming up to 64. Uh, I would like to go uh, a boat until I'm 70. And you know, I'm determined. I'm, I'm really going to uh, publish, publish, publish. Uh, and to bring a lot of students undergraduate, uh, MSc and PhD students with me, as well as colleagues. So that, uh, you know, we're, we're all going to benefit from that focus on getting the work we're doing actually published and out there and recognised. Every paper that we have published has the university's name on it and it lifts the status of the university. So I think, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a wonderful place to actually work because people, because it's small, people are much more accessible. So you, you can go up to people and have conversations with them. Whereas, you know, I mean, at Manchester, Professor Brian Cox gives one lecture of, uh, a year, you know, and he's escorted in by the security guards. He's escorted out by the security guards. You know, you pay to, to hear him. Well, you'd be better off sitting at home watching him on the telly. Wow. You know, because you're not going to see much more of them than that, you know. So that's the that's the, the, the flip side of the top places that uh, you're not going to have the personal contact that you always get in a university like the University of Bowen. So is that where you see your journey going next with regards to the publications? So that's my next question is, we know what's happened in the, the, your past journey. Where do you see yourself going? Uh, well, I mean... When you're a professor, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. We because haven't actually got to that stage yet. Just, just as the PhD is the pinnacle uh, of academic qualifications in terms of academic posts. Now, you know, unless you, you want to go into management, and I have no interest in going into management. I, I want to uh, leave a legacy in terms of publications. 
with my students and with my colleagues. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely at present. I think I'm on fire publication wise. Uh, and, you know, and you, you've got to be robust because, you know, every week there's at least one rejection of the paper. Uh, so you actually then, okay, look at the comments. How do we change this? Where else can we send it? And it's about never giving up. Actually never believing that paper is not going to be published somewhere. You know, and I suppose, you know, it's, it's the opposite of imposter syndrome. You actually, it's a sort of belief. Well, the great man Isaac said it to me once when I said to him, I was get, got on the lift with the, the guy at the Institute of Psychiatry one day, uh, just Isaac and me in the lift. Now, he was probably about 81 then. And uh, I said to him, uh, well, I, I read in Gibson's biography of you, Professor Isaac, that uh, when you're an undergraduate, you published six papers. And he said, yes, that's correct. So I sort of said, well, it must have been easier to get published in those days, mustn't it? So he paused for a second and, and said, well, you know, nowadays there are so many journals. I suppose it balances out. And of course, he's entirely right. There are thousands of journals. So I always say to students, there's a journal there waiting for your paper. You just don't know what journal it is at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, it's a pecking order of journals. So obviously, the, you know, you don't start by sending your first paper to The Lancet, which is an impact factor of over 70. Why and rejects at the top. <laughs> well, it rejects over 95% of the papers, that's why. So, you know, to be in the 5% that's accepted is going to be really hard. So you start at the bottom and you work your way up. You know, Somebody so you want to tell me if you think you can, you can. Well, yeah, yeah, well, Ken's entirely right, but uh, I think I don't think Ken's got any papers in the Lancet, unfortunately. <laughs> He's done a number of books. And this is another thing you have to watch for with books. And we've been caught out a couple of times with this. So uh, one of my colleagues who has since moved back to Greece, the, the great uh, Yanis Matsukas, uh, we had an application for an American PhD student who'd written a couple of books. And uh, he wanted to do a PhD by publication. And Yanis said, great, great. We came to Bolton and we did a presentation. There was only four of us at the presentation. And I, I asked him the question, I said, uh, by the way, who, who published the books? Who, who was the publisher? And he said, I did. I paid for them myself. And I thought, oh, no. And Yanis, uh, I think I had to give him CPR, actually, <laughs> collapsed at that point. Because, of course, anyone, if you've got money, anyone can get a book published. Uh, to have it uh, uh, produced by a proper publisher, it has to be peer reviewed and go through all sorts of quality procedures. So what he actually had to do was to then write a couple of peer reviewed papers, which he did, and they were published. And in the end, he got his PhD by publication. Mm -hmm. Wonderful chap, David Mahal. But, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't looking good when we heard the books were actually self published or sometimes referred to as vanity publishing. So if you see a book that's like that, you have to raise your eyebrows a bit. And I think a number of Ken's, uh, he, he paid for them himself uh, to be published. And that's great. Yeah, it's great. You know, a lot of people do it. But it's not the same as having to go through the peer review process mm -hmm. and have experts scrutinise the, the, the work. Okay. So you've mentioned publications just yeah. a few times. How many do you need then to be number one at Bolton? To be, how many do you need to? Be number one. At Bolton. Number one, okay. Uh, 215 at the moment. Uh, the top, the top uh, publishing person is Professor Dick Horrocks, who has, uh, he's, he's retired and he, he still continues to work part time. And uh, now, I mean, he's not publishing as many as he used to. So uh, he's, he's, he's slowing down. So I'm rapidly catching him. <laughs> I don't know how many years it's going to take me to catch him. But uh, then you, you set the bar for other people that are coming behind. Uh, I mean, it's, it's important because, uh, you know, I think having an element of competition is good. I mean, you know, we want and we are striving to make psychology 
the best department in the university because we're psychologists, because we believe in a subject. We want to make sure that uh, the quality of our students, the quality of our research is the best in the university. Uh, last year, uh, I think we were 25 in the Guardian League tier, 20, 23, 25. The highest ever. Now, the, the, the thing about that league table is there's no research element in it. And yet universities are judged by research. Uh, I think the best we've done in the Sunday Times is 45 out of about 120 departments. So we're actually punching above our weight. And we, we have a number of sort of very ambitious colleagues who uh, you know, want to publish, they want to get research grants. They want to really lift the department and, you know, we want it to be a place that the students are really excited to be there because they know that they're going to get published. They know they're going to achieve things in the department. Yeah, it's a really good ethos to have. I mean, I can um, say I've certainly enjoyed my time at, within the psychology department at the University of Bolton. It is very much like a family. It certainly is. Um, now then, I do think we've probably skipped a bit again. We do seem to skip backwards and forwards. You mentioned that you are a professor and you're at the top you can be. How did you get to that journey? Uh, right, okay. Well, you get on that journey by landing a professorial post when one is advertised. You know, sometimes in life you have a bit of luck. We all need a bit of luck. It's the it's probably the thing that most people are reluctant to admit because everyone likes to think they've got more control in life than in reality we have. Uh, a lot of the time in life, uh, you know, uh, we can get lucky breaks. So uh, I had retired from the NHS at the age of 54. I was sat at home and thinking, what am I going to do next? What do I want to do next? I was enjoying the life. I was going to the Royal Society of Medicine, which was my working man's club up in the centre of London, at over 400 quid for a year's membership. Oh, wow. And uh, a wonderful sort of environment. And I'd come to the conclusion, my NHS pension wasn't fantastic. So I thought, I'm going to have to get another job. And having spent my entire career working clinically, as well as doing clinical research, I thought, well, uh, why don't I go into teaching and try teaching? And uh, I had a go at applying for a few jobs and uh, I got an interview at Bolton. And because I wasn't working, I, I spent a couple of weeks researching everything about Bolton. And uh, so when I arrived for the interview, I knew a lot about the university. And, you know, it's quite obvious. And I've been for an informal visit before. If you really want a job, you've got to go and make an informal visit, meet the people, show how committed you are. But very fortunately, there were only two other applicants for the job. Uh, and out of the, the, the three, they obviously chose to offer me the job. Uh, so I came to Bolton. And when uh, after I gave one of my first lectures, one of the students came up to me and, and, and was rather puzzled. said, why'd you come to Bolton? And I said, well, actually, uh, if I was offered a professorial post, I'd have even gone to Scotland <laughs> because to get a professorial post is a sort of dream. And I mean, before I even came, I was having dreams about graduation day. And graduation day is, of course, uh, an amazing day. I wouldn't uh, know. Well, you will, you will, you will soon. Uh, but graduation day is an amazing day when, you know, we sort of all the academics parade. You get to meet uh, the family of the students, uh, partners of the students. And uh, it's, it's a sort of culmination of all the work you've done with that particular student. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's incomparable, really, uh, you know, because in, in one event, all of that work is encapsulated. So, you know, you'll have your undergrads, you'll have your master's students. You may even be lucky enough as I've been to have some PhD students graduating as well. Uh, so that, that's one of the greatest things I think about university. And, and I think Bolton is, is particularly good at its graduations. <coughs> it's once said by an academic who used to be here, George does a great graduation. 
and he's entirely right. Uh, the vice chancellor does a great graduation and it, the ceremony is, is always a fantastic ceremony. And I think, uh, you know, the vice chancellor very correctly has said uh, that, you know, our priority as a university is the student experience. And uh, one of the things about in the NHS was uh, Great Ormond Street used to have the strap line, uh, the child first and always the child first and always. So their services are based around what's best for children. And, you know, in the same way, uh, universities, particularly in this, this day and age, have to really focus on the student's experience. Because, you know, if that student's experience isn't good, you'll go to the university next door. And, you know, well, we're, you know, you know, I don't know, 140, 150 universities in this country. 120 do psychology. So you've got, you've got a choice, you know, if you actually don't like it, you know, even here, you've got MMU, you've got University of Manchester, you've got Salford, you've got Chester, three universities in Liverpool, you've got Lancaster, you've got Cumbria. That's just in the Northwest region. You've got, and you've, I, I forgot you, Clan. You've got all of those different universities uh, around. So, you know, uh, our university has to ensure that we are the best for student experience. Otherwise, students aren't going to come to us. So you have to put the student at the centre of everything. Uh, having said that, I think that uh, students themselves have a responsibility. And one of the things that you're doing, along with other peers, is you're reinvigorating the postgraduate student body. And, uh, you know, I think the more effort you put into that, you know, the, the more you will get out of it. Now, you're not going to have all the student body behind you because it's such a diverse body. There are lots of people, for example, who live in London, who come up for supervision sessions, people who work remotely increasingly now. But I think, uh, you know, you will get out more than you put in uh, from uh, that engagement. And I think you're doing some phenomenal things. How do you think um, the University of Bolton compares to your experience at University of Reading? Uh, I know it's very different with times. I imagine that's changed dramatically. Well, bizarrely, uh, there were fewer people at the University of Reading when I was there than there are at University of Bolton today. Yeah. However, nowadays, the University of Reading has an intake of over 300 psychology students. In my day, there were about 60 of us. Uh, so, you know, the universities were much, numbers of students were much smaller than they are today. Uh, so about you know, 100 at Bolton, is it about 100 in psychology? Yeah, over 100. Yeah, 130, 140 now in uh, first year. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you, you actually, very interestingly, of course, the, the university with the lowest number of uh, psychology students is Cambridge really? which only has about 50 psychology students is that uh, exactly 50? but but what 50 they've got you know they obviously are able to take the absolute cream of the cream they've never met me <laughs> they never met you and I think one of the, the one of the interesting things that uh, is is very important and is much undervalued and underemphasized uh, I, one of my students, well, not one of my students, one of our students uh, recently came across a theory uh, that talked about scrappers versus silver spooners. And this was from an American uh, TEDx talk. And of course, one of the things we have at the University of Bolton is lots of our people have had to scrap for what they've got in life. They weren't born, as it were, with silver spoons in their mouths. So, you know, we don't have many people who've been to public school at the University of Bolton. A lot of our people have come up from the, through the state school system. A lot of our people have done access courses. We have a foundation course. So people who are not as strong uh, academically, but they're very strong in terms of their life experiences. Uh, and uh, I mean, one of the things that's particularly enjoyable uh, about working, for example, with mature students, 
is because our mature students have so much life experience behind them that you can you, you are much more of a on a peer to peer level I think with mature students you know, someone's 19 20 I mean you know your world's apart well I am when I'm at nearly 64 I'm a world apart from them you know my children are older than that uh, I have a granddaughter who, who's actually uh, 19. Oh, so, uh, you know, uh, and I, I think we, we get a lot of uh, exceptional mature students. I mean, we get exceptional young students as well. But I think, and, and, and of course, the mature students actually know about how to relate to people professionally. They are all very professional, all very respectful. So, uh, you know, I think they're an absolute joy uh, to work with and you can really get them enthused in projects. And uh, I think that's a great thing. You know, we are the most socially inclusive university in England. Uh, uh, second, I think, in the whole of Britain, there's a Scottish university that's slightly better than us, but uh, I think we are the, certainly the best in England in terms of social inclusion. I think for me, one of the best um, things about the University of Bolton when it comes to it, I, I prefer older student rather than mature. I'm not entirely sure I've matured a bit yet, but um, is the level of belief that you give us. I think the advice you get, the support you get from lecturers, not just one lecturer, across the board, is the belief to believe in yourself and that, you know, we could go back to if you believe you can, you can. It's, it's that ethos you know I, I certainly have felt that and it's impacted on me to the point where I now believe I can complete a PhD whereas when I first came to the University of Bolton I, I wasn't even sure about doing an undergraduate degree so I think that's for me what's what's set Bolton apart from different universities it's the staff members and the yeah the belief that they give you I think in fact, I only chose the University of Bolton because of your talk back in April 2017. Oh, yourself, wow. That's a, yourself and Dr. Phil Brown. I remember it like it was yesterday. Tremendously flattering to, to hear that. Thank you. Uh, I was actually supposed to go to UCLan afterwards and I cancelled because I decided Bolton was it. Well, UCLan's a very good university uh, and a very good for psychology. Uh, as uh, you know, and a lot of universities in the northwest of England are very good psychology departments. I didn't mention Edge Hill, that was another one I forgot. But, uh, you know, very good psychology departments. Uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think what you get at, at Bolton, I think you're, you, you're entirely right that the lecturers will have more time for you. And it's not just one lecturer, but a whole bunch of colleagues who uh, are, are very supportive and encouraging yeah. and get a great uh, thrill out of the success of the students uh, you know so your success is our success you know when when you get your degree when you get when you walk on and get your PhD you know there'll be a lot of staff actually feeling really proud and really pleased for you because they've known you they all know you uh, whereas you know if, if you're one of 300 how are you going to get known it's impossible uh, so in a small university, you're going to get much more personal attention and uh, much more so as a PhD student. But I mean, obviously, that attention is focused more on your director of studies and your second uh, uh, supervisor. And very important uh, for all PhD students to realise the most important support you're going to get is peer support. You know, so supporting each other because you're in the same boat. I mean, you know, my PhD viva was, uh, second viva was 2005. Well, that's 15, 16 years ago. Oh, how anxious was I? Mm, can't quite remember. Uh, and with each passing year, you, you remember it less. But uh, uh, that's going to be a big day. <laughs> Not to frighten you. <laughs> Okay, so do you, sort of the last part then, do you have any advice for PhD students or students in general? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, it, one of the things that struck me was when I worked as an assistant psychologist, uh, 
I was I knew all the papers had been published in a particular area. Uh, I was probably at one of my most uh, dynamic phases in, in my life, but I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't I didn't capitalize on it. And, and you know, guy I was working with certainly didn't encourage me to think about publishing anything. So I, I, I think you my advice would be to to make the best of the situation you're in, uh, because you know, you, you will not, you, you, you're only a PhD student once, like you're only an undergraduate student once. And that, that process soon ends. So I think like you're doing, getting involved in it, uh, along with other colleagues, getting involved in the process, trying to shape the process, working with the academics, you'll get more out of it. So, you know, it really is, it's like anything in life, isn't it? The more you put in, the more you get out yeah. but you're going to be the winner because when you get that phd and really i mean i think uh, you know there's some academics say well you know you're only a proper academic if you you've actually you know done a, a teacher training for example uh in universities i think uh, the, the two things that are really important in universities i mean obviously you've got to be a very good teacher it goes without saying, particularly now, student experience. But, you know, you've got to have a PhD. Uh, and there are different ways of getting a PhD now, PhD by professional practice, PhD by publication. And, and not just the route that most of you are going down, which is PhD by research. So, you know, academics, university, you've got to have a PhD. Second thing is you, you've got to have publications. You know, uh, I mean, if you can write a PhD, Publication is actually quite easy by comparison because a PhD is a phenomenal document, 80,000 words. A paper, 3,000 words, sometimes 2,000 words. So, uh, you know, I think that's the, that's the thing. You've actually, uh, uh, you know, it will keep you in good stead the rest of your life, having that PhD. That is the path forward. Supreme academic accolade. Uh, work hard. There's, there's no there's no secret to success. Really, it's all about hard work. You know, uh, I mean, Tony Blair used to intone the mantra: education, education, education. Well, I would say hard work, hard work, hard work. Uh, you know, the harder you work, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the sort of golf player, uh, golfer Gary Player, I think once said. Uh, so oh, that was a lucky shot out of the bunker. How did you get that one in the hole? And he said, you know, a funny thing that the more I practice, the luckier I seem to get, <laughs> you know, and in a sense, it's a bit, you know, PhD is a bit like that. The harder you work, uh, the more you achieve, you know. And one of our students actually, when he had, had his PhD viva, he'd already published about four or five papers. And the, the reports before the, the Viva were, this student has already published in peer-reviewed publications. They must be good. Yeah, you know, that, that's peer-reviewed. That's what the Viva is about. You're being reviewed by a peer to see whether you're wor worthy of the type of a PhD, the supreme academic accolade. Two people decide that. Uh, for most of you, an external examiner, an internal examiner. Those people determine your academic fate. You know, it's a it's a strange system we have, but that's the system we actually have. And the harder you've worked at it through those three years, the easier it's going to be, because you will have covered all the bases in your research. And with good supervision, you know, you should you should get through that. Most people succeed. The the and you know the, the, the failure rate of PhDs is very low. Uh, you know, and whether you have imposter syndrome or not, good supervision will see you get through that, and you'll be confident that you will get through that. Good. Thank you. I think we need Thanks. to end on, don't count the days, make the days count. Very true. I think, yeah, make the days count. Make the days of your PhD count, because you won't get those days back. And uh, you, you know, avail yourself of every opportunity, including the possibility to do the teacher training module, the pet module, 
try and make sure you do that as well. So that gives you an extra arm to your CV. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.